My name's Luke. As he said, I work for And Yet. I'm a Yeti, um, and I also live in the woods, and they did film an episode of Finding Bigfoot in the town where I live, so related, maybe, maybe not. We're not sure, not saying yes or no. Um, so I'm going to talk about ampersand, which is a non-frameworky framework, and that probably doesn't make any sense, so that's why I'm here to explain it. Um, so we're going to talk about what is ampersand, kind of some philosophy behind it, and then dig into some code samples to see like how it solves some problems that if you're writing front-end web apps, you might have hit and you might have said, how do I do this? I'm really annoyed with how hard this is to do. So uh, first, those are kind of awesome and there's stickers of those out in the front. So um, I highly suggest picking those up. <laughs> um, done by the talented Lynn Fisher, who's uh, also on the core team. So what is ampersand? Um, Starts off, it started off as kind of our own thing we built on top of Backbone, which, uh, who here has used Backbone? A lot of people, it's been around for a long time. It was kind of the, one of the, one of the first MVC type things to really um, have a lot of people use it. So we started kind of as on top of Backbone, then we kind of forked it, and then we said, you know, we really, we live in node land like all the time. We want tiny modules, so we kind of, forked it, and then divided it up into node-style modules. So everything's a module.exports, and it's its own file, and everything's great. But Backbone still kind of fell short in a lot of ways, so um, some advanced features that we were kind of using in every single web app, and stuff that we had built on into our Backbone fork, which, or, you know, it wasn't a true fork. We didn't fork it on, on GitHub, but it was, in the essence, um, it created ampersand. And so ampersand tries to be what you need in the same kind of style as Backbone, but providing a lot more features for um, today's web apps. And there's really no um, core. Like, you know, there's this many modules at least. Um, so you have view, state, collection, subcollection. Um, if you npm install ampersand, it's just the CLI tool. So um, there's a lot of modules in there, and we don't aim to say, like, you need all of these every time. Um, you don't need them all by any means, but the pieces are there so you can um, install them when you need them. Like I'm guessing most of the time you do a web app, you're going to need state, you're going to need view, you're going to need collections, um, and stuff like that. Um, and what do I mean when I say like node style? So they're all on NPM, first of all, and who's, who's put their front end code on NPM before? Raise your hand. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty good idea. And the, and the maintainers of NPM say, like, this is not just for Node. Like, put your JavaScript here. Put other stuff here. So, um, if, if you click that little, if you go to this um, talk later and click the NPM logo, that's the keyword ampersand on NPM. So, there's a lot of stuff there. And um, other people have started creating stuff, tagging it NPM. Um, so, it's all on there. And we try to keep everything small, focused modules, you know, Unix philosophy, Node philosophy that um, Nodes does really well. And then um, we tried to Semver everything, and Semver is not, it's not perfect, um, but we found that it enables us to do like, you know, when we know we're going to have a breaking change, we bump the major version. And we, we're careful not to do that all the time, but uh, it gives us the ability to do that. And also, um, since we Semver everything, like, you know, we have quick releases. If you, if you submit a patch and fix a quick bug, most of the time that can get out that day. I mean, uh, pull requests that come in with um, the fix and a test and a documentation thing, like that's the easiest job in the world to hit merge pull request. And then we, we test everything with uh, Browserify. Again, who's used Browserify for front end stuff? So again, it's like it's on par with NPM where just um, we use it for everything. Like if you haven't if you haven't used it, check it out. My talk's not going to go into what Browserify is, but it's such a powerful tool when combined when combined with npm for this stuff. Um, so in our case, it allows us to run npm tests. It Browserifies our module, runs it through tape, and we have it's all tested. And then if you run start, it opens it up in your local browser so you can see all the tests running. So. Um, most like modules you install, you npm start, it's going to maybe spin up a server or something. These are all front end stuff, so it's no servers, but um, you'll, it'll enable you to see the code, see what we're testing, and all that. And so, and lastly, we build, we build them for the browser. So even though they're on npm, 
This is for the browser. Um, and then that's the browser file logo and the Webpack logo. So Webpack I haven't used before, but I'm, it's supposed to be in the same vein as Browserify where you take these modules and it bundles them all for you for easy consumption on the web. And lastly, it's really flexible because as you saw before, there's tons of different modules. If you don't want Vue, don't use Vue. If you want to build something on top of Vue, fork it or extend it and do stuff like that. But Oh, it's also really flexible. Sorry about that. Um, so when I say flexible, you know, have, you, have anyone ever been burned by like a really flexible tool before? So flexible. What do I do with it? I have no idea. Um, so when you say flexible, I hear foot guns. Um, who's built an, a huge app with Backbone? Anybody? Would, did you have any foot guns eventually? It's really flexible. So. Um, and then this is not to, you know, knock on Backbone or knock on anything else. You could run into the same problems with Ampersand. But we hopefully offset those by providing well-defined approaches for doing the stuff that we know you're going to want to do. And then also trying to maximize simplicity. So if you look at a file, you can say, I, I can figure out what that's doing. That's not complicated. It's not magic. It doesn't look really hard. Um, so I'm currently in the process of porting a 15,000 line backbone app to ampersand. And so um, things look a lot cleaner so far. It's not done. Um, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world, like any, any rewrite, but um, the simplicity and the approaches we're, we're providing are making, making my life a lot easier. Um, and lastly, it's a composable. So when I say that, I mean, um, can you guys read that? Um, so we have ampersand model. What is ampersand model? It's ampersand state with ampersand sync built in. So it's basically like ampersand model is, I don't know, like 100 lines of code, something like that. So it's state's huge, not huge, but a lot bigger than that. So there's state and then we mix in sync. And so if you wanted your own version of ampersand model, you could take ampersand model, plug in a new sync adapter, and then you have ampersand local storage or something like that. Same with ampersand rest collection. It's as you've come to know backbone collections, but um, restful. Like by default, ampersand collections have no rest functionality because we found a lot of times you just want to manage collections of models. You don't need you don't need like you know to fetch those or do anything like that. So it, we provide a rest mix in which goes into collection and then an underscore mix in to provide you know your for eaches and stuff like that. Um, and then ampersand views, you'll see. So there's ampersand view, collection view. We have our own DOM bindings library. And then it also inherits from state, which as we'll see later is pretty cool to have like really stateful views. Um, and then lastly, ampersand your module or mix in could depend on React if you want. Um, if you don't want the ampersand view layer, there's some new crazy stuff no one has ever heard of. That name is available on NPM if you if you really want to make that right now um, and depend on state. So part of the app I'm doing now is trying to make ampersand-ish views and, and stuff that will, can be used across apps for like business logic, for things that are well encapsulated that more than one app's going to use. And doing that in ampersand is actually pretty easy. Um, so let's look at uh, state. So here's like an example of like if you're calling state, uh, if you want to make a state module. So we have props, which is, as you come to know them, like backbone, those get persisted to the server. Um, ampersand state, we try to make, we try to have it type everything. So if you make something a type and try to assign it to something else, it's going to, it's going to tell you don't do that. So you can also set it to any if you don't want that. Um, and then session properties are not by default persisted. So those are stuff like if those only live for like the, the portion of the application that's actually running in the browser. And then derived properties can depend on, on props or session. So in this case, you'll see I'm creating a new person and binding to its uh, change event for title. And title depends on name and type. So if I change my name, it's going to emit a change event for title. And if I change the type, it's also going to emit a change event. That's pretty basic, you know, derive properties, but it's something that we've always kind of wanted in Backbone and it didn't exist. So it's nice to have those. Um, the next step is 
you can have children. So you can have a child state event that takes, um, your parent state event that also has a child. And so, and those can have props and derived properties. And as you can see, um, we have assignee.title. So assignee is a state, a child state property. And that's going to um, trigger change events all the way up the chain for as many things as it's depended upon. So you can still derive from children. And state's really powerful for modeling like relationships in your app because most stuff is not just going to be flat most of the time. You know, most JSON that you're grabbing from your server is not flat. You have nested. You want to depend on children. You want parent, or children to depend on parents and stuff like that. So in this case, um, that last line, I'm taking the assignee of the project and changing the type, and it's going to trigger all the way up the chain to say um, to change the title of the project. Um, uh, next, we have subcollections. So a subcollection is just like you know it in Backbone, um, a basically a collection, except we have this filter property and a wash property. So those are still can do anywhere up the up the chain of of children or properties or anything. So um, we have our our filter is only going to return um, a type of ampersand. So only if my project's assignee type is ampersand will that subcollection contain that model. So in this case, if I take the, um, the original length of it, it's five. If I change a type to JS, it's four. If I change another type to JS, it's three. So um, as you can see, the collections um, also can take those drive properties, take those change events, and works kind of as you'd expect. Um, the last thing, uh, as I mentioned before, um, stateful views. So this looks a lot like the state object I showed before. So we have, we have derived properties on our, um, on our view. So before, uh, my project has a title, but a lot of times you don't want to be storing, I, I want to change the title just for display purposes, but that's not something that you want to do in your model, because then you have, you all of a sudden have all this, um, all this like view presentation layer data in your model, which is not something that you want. So in this case, we have the model ID and the model title, and then I'm just concatenating those and providing just some display layer stuff. Like I don't want to put parentheses anywhere in my model. That just doesn't make any sense. And then um, the binding is uh, the title. So the title is just the name of the property, and then I'm just binding to the LI. Um, so that's, and then um, by default, it'll just append it as text to the LI. So we have the LI, we're just adding that text, um, and then it still keeps track of all our model changes. And then last, you're going to want to render this somehow. Like you have all these great um, dependencies, or I mean, you have all these great um, dependent relationships of models in your stuff. Um, and then, so we provide a render collection method in your view, which will take a collection, um, a view for that collection, and then a place to put it. So in the case we already talked about, like we have ampersand, which is only the, only the projects that are, have a type of ampersand, and we're rendering those um, into our project view, which I didn't show, but it's basically a view that you know, puts stuff in the LI. Oh no, I did show it on the last slide. And then the render collection view keeps track of add, it keeps track of remove, it keeps track of sort, and then our previous um, view kept track of all our actual model changes. So if you can't um, picture what this looks like so far, let's see if the demo. Is all the post. Sorry, I'm on the Wi-Fi. What? It just seems to be going really slow. It's, it says it's waiting. It knows the host name. Hmm. All right, so not sure if we're going to have a demo. Oh, all right, sweet. So in this case, we have, um, and I added, all, all this code right here is just duplication of what I already showed. So it's just a different filtering method on a subcollection, and I'm rendering more collections. So. It's too big. Everyone see that? 
So in this case, we have um, ampersand, which is these are all with a type of ampersand. We have other, which are all anything without a type of ampersand. We have mine, which is anything with Luke carries as the name. And then anything not mine is anything without Luke carries as the name. So I added some stuff to add from the console, so I wouldn't have to remember how to type it. So if I change this, I'm getting the model, and, and this is in our base collection, so I'm not um, doing, I'm not altering the sub collections in any way. So I have projects, uh, get one, so one is JSLA slash JS slash loop carries, and if I change the assignee name to other, it changed the type to other, but it also moved it from mine to not mine. And then if I change it again to other, see it's just going to update the actual text and not move it around. And then same thing with type. If I change that to ampersand, it's going to move it from, from the JS view to the ampersand view. Um, and then, and so that is by default happens on add, remove, sort, um, pretty much any event as you would expect. And then, um, the content bindings are all handled by the, the first, the first view I showed. So if you wanted something besides the text to be there, or you wanted, uh, the DOM bindings provide Boolean class, classes, the attributes, pretty much anything you would want, you could bind all those. Like, I, I did the simplest view possible, which was an li with text in it. Um, so those are all possible. So if you take, um, I'll have this, this is on the internet. If you, if you go through the demo later, you can see, you can run the source and see everything, um, manipulate it, see how it would work, test it, um, just get to know it. And also, uh, if you go to, uh, if you're actually on the presentation and you just want to play with ampersand stuff, view, state, collection, sub collection are all just globals. So that's ampersand view. That's what view.extend does. So you, if you just want to play with it and just like hack stuff and see what happens, um, I found it was a pretty good way just to see what it's doing. And then um, something we believe in is like the lowest barrier to entry possible. So if you want to um, get involved, we have a whole uh, contribution page. We use Git Chat, Gitter. I, I don't know exactly what it's called. We just started using it. So it's like super, it's just a web view. You can connect to it through IRC on a, um, for any GitHub project. Oops, I guess I can. Um, and we also have a public roadmap on Trello. If there's a feature you want, um, come vote on it, create a card, um, take place in the discussion there. And then, um, oops. Uh, if you want to look at how we triage bugs, you can check that out. It actually says, be nice in there. So if you're, if you're, if you've never submitted a pull request or an issue to open source project before, don't be afraid. If you find a bug, file it. If you have a fix, file it. Um, we'd love to have it. And then here's some more, uh, resources. We have a whole tools page, which is, um, third party tools, other different non ampersand related tools that work really well with ampersand. We have our whole documentation, uh, quick start guides, we have video tutorials, um, and then a human JavaScript book, and then um, if you just want to dig into source, the I found the ampersand to do MVC app is like a really good way to see, like a, you know, as real world as a to-do app is, see all the, all the things I just showed you, bindings, sub collections, filtering, all that stuff like at, used in like a real, real world way. Um, Lastly, thank you. Uh, follow me on Twitter or just come chat um, or sign up for the newsletter if you want to receive more ampersand and yet-ish related things. Thanks. <laughs> any, any questions? Non-frameworky framework? Yeah. Uh, real quick, is this, how, how would it work if you have deep property like that? Um, 
So, I mean, like I, uh, like I showed the types in, in when you set properties, so there's a type of array. The only thing is we don't extend any um, native prototypes, so you're not going to be able to listen to add on just a plain array. So if you want to listen to an add event, you're gonna, it's going to need to be a collection. Same thing, like, you could make something an object if you want it to be a dumb object. If you want to be able to listen to those events, um, you, can, you can have, uh, like I showed, you can have a child state, state mod, model. Anything else? Is there any, does anyone have any like, this was hard to do in Backbone or can I do this in Ampersand or anything like that? Cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you just had a hard time with them. Anything specific like? I, I, I know what you're saying like, so um, in Backbone collections tended to be just like a wrapper that provided methods to like change a collection, but not, but not enough power to like, what do I do with this? How do I just like, you know, a few lines of code make the thing I want to make. So that's why we made um, render collection is actually just a, like a, a few line function that calls, um, creates a new collection view, which is another ampersand. Um, and so I feel like without like something to render collections, like they're not a whole lot of use. So we have a collection view, which um, you can pass it a collection, do add, remove, sort, and like it auto updates all your change events and everything. Um, and besides that, like I'm trying to think of what other ways that we've kind of extended backbone collections. Um, I think I just I'm not sure if there's a lot you can do with collections besides like there's not a lot of people want they want. A collection of things, get some, get something at an index, you know, get the length of it. But we did make sub collection, which is, um, which extends that to say like we want to make, you know, you can get really advanced filters and listening properties to make like, like I showed, like four different sub collections based on the same collection. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, you're talking about in the CLI tool? Yeah. 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 Can you speak to that a little bit? Like, does that change your development flow a little bit? Does it really make that first? Yeah. I found that very easy. So, let's see. Like, I mean, we believe heavily in like API. API first stuff. So I think if you start with a data model, like that's like that's like one of the more difficult things you're going to run into in your app is like, yeah, I have this data model. Once you see, and you can kind of plan out your plan out your dependencies, how how children are going to depend on their parent, you know, stuff like that. And so um, I actually didn't write that code, um, but I know I know there was a need for it, and so um, I'm I'm glad you like it. I don't I don't, I don't know about that. Um, so I haven't used it as much just because the thing I'm writing right now is like a rewrite, so um, I'm porting a lot of code over, but um, if, back up, um, I, I imagine if you're like, if you know, Greenfield, you're just making a new thing, like it's, I, I would use it, yeah. Cool. I have another one. Yeah. I noticed that the templates the first line is pretty completely logical. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, ampersand tries to be as agnostic about that as possible. So for demo purposes, I was showing just you know strings, and then the bindings allow you to just like bind to those. So um, it also it'll accept a string, um, an HTML element, or a function that returns either of those. And then and so by default, um, if you call render, it's going to pass your model to it. And so if you if you wanted to have like I have. Um, we use Jade for a lot of stuff, so which has a lot of logic in there. So if you did have Jade um, and you had an object that you're passing to it, you could do all your if statements, all your. Um, By default, was it supported in the model? Like like, like the for strings, each stuff. The strings in there. Like like you showed with the li, if you like the model value, and like without a binding. Oh, not without a binding. Okay. That's the, that's the goal of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, if you did, if you create, if you make your template a function, it'll pass 
the model to it. So if you did want to have this huge function that gets past the model and then you're doing it in plain JavaScript, you could do that. Um, it doesn't have all the built-ins of handlebars though. Um, I, I bet you could get it to work with handlebars if you really wanted to. But I have found that that's one of the, the things I've liked most about like porting an app to it is um, the bindings and how much how much logic I can take out of my templates. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yes. Um, one thing I didn't show because it's, I mean, we have a whole huge documentation learning page on it um, is form stuff. And uh, to kind of go in just a high level of like our, our um, how it works is like you have a form view and then there's actually separate views for each type of input. And so a form view is just going to take, you say like, you give it five inputs, five checkboxes, a select, an array input, and then um, your form view is just responsible for, um, basically it'll get a callback whenever the uh, valid state is toggled, and then if you hit submit, or you call submit on it in any way, you'll get, you'll get your object back. And so we found like, Two-way data binding can be difficult, especially for really complex form apps, um, where you're typing something and that's not necessarily the state you want to save at that time. Um, instead, you want to like do some sort of manipulation on it. Um, and so, I've actually created like separate input views for things like this input is responsible for a type ahead, uh, um, and a type ahead to call the API to like receive a, a client, where I know the data structure I'm getting back. And then I can enforce that in its own view, whether it's valid or not, and then not pass it back to the model until it is. So high level, super high level, that's like how uh, form stuff would work. But it's really powerful. Like that's some of the reusable stuff I've created so far is things like, you know, date pickers with, you know, special logic in it because we're doing an app where we don't want any time zone support. We only want stuff to start uh, on a certain, you know, at zero zero of the, of the day. So. Specific stuff like that, you can have data validation, not necessarily in your model, where it might be more view specific. Cool.